I printed off. Well, hey there. Um, so this is um, a, a meeting that we've tried to, that we've tried to arrange for a little bit, and uh, this is with the Grad Fund. So the Grad Fund is a really um, good organization within SGS that really helps students get all sorts of funding and support in fundraising moves. So I had originally talked to Teresa Del Corso to um, present, you know, she's offered to present this stuff, and we couldn't work out her schedule, so we are very lucky to have Dawn Wells here. And Dawn is a sixth year anthropology student, um, and they have a set of these peer uh, support people, students who've gone through these kinds of things, gotten funding. And, and Dawn is, uh, I just met her, but she's doing some really interesting work um, in, in her uh, dissertation work that maybe she'll say a little bit about, and Ashley's taking the point for that. But anyway, but it, so I'm just going to let Dawn take this over, and uh, I hope this will be interactive, right? Yeah. People can yep. just uh, ask questions, and, and, uh, and so thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, so some people are streaming in, is that right? If they have questions, can they? It's in community. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Drew. As you mentioned, my name is Dawn, um, and I am a peer mentor at Grad Fund, which I'll explain a little bit um, what that means in a second. Um, but first, I'm forgetting to figure. Um, I just thought I'd give you an overview of what I was going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to be going over. But I heard Drew say SGS, so everyone knows that lingo. Um, School of Graduate Studies, Fellowships and Awards, and then giving some background about what Grad Fund is and what services we have, uh, and then a bit of general information about kind of what, what it's like to apply for um, external funding. Um, okay, so uh, to give you, this is the overview of SGS scholarships and awards. So <clears throat> the first thing um, to kind of emphasize is that we uh, suggest an integrative approach when we're looking at these different awards. So essentially, as a Rutgers graduate student, you're eligible for internal awards, which means awards that come from within the School of Graduate Studies. So I don't know if any of you have applied for anything like the um, pre-dissertation, beginning the terminology. Um, there's conference travel funds, are you guys um, aware of those kinds of things? So those kinds of things um, you'll usually get from your grad director or someone, they'll email those kinds of things out to you. And um, grad fund can't help with those awards. So grad fund, the kind of MO of grad fund is that we're meant to help graduate students get funding except from external sources. Um, and so we can help with the bottom two. Oh, I forgot. That's okay. And now will it go back? Even if you, okay. Yeah. I've got to not touch there you the go. <laughs> um, So external awards. So there's about three and a half thousand external awards for graduate students, which is a lot, but that, I mean, that includes everything. It includes small awards, multi-year awards, um, awards that fund early graduate studies, that fund your dissertation write-up, it includes everything. Um, but as you can see, there is a lot of external awards out there. And then within that kind of big category, there's also SGS managed awards, which means that certain awards that are external have to be kind of um, administered from within the School of Graduate Studies. Usually that means Teresa Del Corso, who runs Grad Fund, is the administrator for those awards. So um, you want to be aware, and I'm not going to touch the board, but um, you might have heard of things like Fulbright, it's probably one of the most well-known ones. Um, maybe you've heard of PBO. Anyhow, some of these awards, when you're looking at some external awards, you want to be aware if it's um, stating that you need to be in touch with the graduate school. You can't just apply um, as a graduate student without 
coming through FGS. <coughs> so Grant Fund is a peer mentoring um, program. Essentially what that means is, apart from Teresa Del Corso, who runs Grant Fund, who set it up about 20 years ago, um, everybody else who works in the office are other PhD students. So most of us are later along PhD students. I'm, um, as you mentioned, I'm a sixth year um, anthropology PhD student. Uh, and most of us are kind of maybe finishing up research, usually writing up our dissertations. Um, and we have all been through the process of applying for external awards um, and been successful some form or another. Um, and we've been trained to be what we call an outside reader. So when you make an appointment with Grad Fund, if nobody in the graduates uh, in the GSE works at Grad Fund, but if they did, you wouldn't actually meet with them. You'd always meet with somebody in a different discipline because we're trained to be able to read across um, all disciplines. So somebody uh, in neurology can come and make an appointment with me and I can help guide them with their application. Um, so the idea with peer mentoring is that you're, you're you're getting help from people who've been through what you're doing, but we've also been trained to uh, you know, help you be successful. Um, so since Teresa Del Corso set up Grad Fund, um, we've raised uh, over $45 million um, in funding for external grants. So we are a very help we're very helpful um, for graduate students who are getting um, external funding. <coughs> So the services, essentially, um, in terms of meeting, meeting with us is probably the most um, kind of important service that we provide. So you can make three different kinds of meetings with us. What can I, I don't know if you can, can you see this clearly enough? Okay, so the first one is what can I apply for? Second one is help with a funder. And the last one is an application essay conference. So essentially that's kind of moving you through the process of applying for grants. So what can I apply for? It's kind of self-explanatory. It's essentially just sitting down, working out what are all the grants and awards that I might be eligible for and working out what I'm going to be competitive for, what I should really just commit my time to applying for. Um, help with a funder is once you kind of hone down, okay, I think I'm going to apply for this award, but I'm I need to understand a little bit more about what this funder wants, what's going to make me competitive, um, how to write this application before I can interact with the That's really useful because it, it's a big step to start um, creating a big external grant application. And it's helpful to have that kind of helping hand that says, all right, let's get this done. This is what you need to think about when you sit down to write. And then the last one, application essay conference, is when you bring in your drafts. Um, and uh, I'll mention this later, but the important thing um, with all of this, but also especially with the application essay conference, is that Grad Fund is not designed to be your sole source of, um, of feedback with your essays. So you would want you to think of Grad Fund as like one piece of the puzzle, along with uh, your, let's say, your committee. Um, other professors in your department that are giving you that more discipline specific feedback and then we're giving you that more kind of outside reader perspective which is I'll, I'll explain a little bit later is really important because of how most of these awards are um, reviewed um, i should have mentioned at the beginning since we have a good chunk of time if you guys have questions as i'm going through just feel free to um, throw out questions um, so I just talked about the, the meetings that you can make with us, but then we have other kinds of services that might be useful for you. So uh, we run workshops and presentations. So this is an example of a grad fund presentation. Um, and then we also run some workshops that are designed to help you. Um, for instance, we run a mentoring program often during the summer. It won't be running this summer, but usually most summer is grad funds. Um, you can apply for the summer mentoring program um, and you have workshops on how to you know, do the things that we talked about before, like research your funder, 
find out what they're looking for, start to draft applications, get them reviewed, and so on. Um, and we also host uh, program directors from these different major granting organizations. So, for instance, big ones like Fulbright or um, Social Science Research Council. Um, a lot of the program directors for those awards actually go around to different major schools and present um, give workshops on their um, their awards. And these are really really useful because uh, it, it's kind of like the help with the funder meeting, but you're actually getting it from the the program director, and they really help students to understand. Okay, what are we? What is this? Or really designed to find how can you make this competitive application. Um, and then also on our website, so gradfund.rotary.edu, there are just a whole bunch of other resources there. So you'll see, um, I think in a later slide, I have an image of the website, but essentially along the top bar, you'll see um, all these tabs. And if you click on them, you've got, um, we've got pages that are, uh, specifically for major awards. So if you say are applying for a big award like a Fulbright, we actually have a page um, on the Fulbright which will give you some information and websites to go to and so on. Um, and we also uh, have web pages that talk about how to prepare an application. Just lots of these questions that um, grad students come up against when they're starting um, their applications. We also have a database um, on the website. So the idea is that you <coughs> at home can uh, search for awards yourself. It's a little bit clunky though. Um, it, it, it's, it's still kind of um, in the process of, what do they call it? It's like beta mode. It, it's, yeah, beta, beta. Um, so the idea is so you would just type in a um, search term um, and then all of these filters, they say things like filter by degree, so you might want to put a PhD, for instance, or filter by citizenship, so you're, if you're not a US citizen, you're only seeing awards that, that non-citizens are eligible for and so on. Um, I recommend with this to keep it very broad and not do many filters <coughs> and then see what you come up with and then filter down from that. But essentially our advice is, you know, go and have a look at this. It's a useful resource. But if you're really trying to understand what is the landscape of funding available for you, come in and have a, a meeting with us because um, it's just much easier for us on our end to do a, a, a more holistic search for you once we just once we know enough about you so we can go into our own database and um, give you a list. So this um, list that I gave most of you is a sample award list of grants that um, GIC students might be eligible for, but um, each one of you are not going to be eligible for all of this because some of them are only um, for US citizens, some of them are only if you're doing quantitative, some are qualitative and so on. Um, so essentially when you have a what can I apply for meeting, we're going to do one specially for you. Um, oh, and this is what I was mentioning earlier on the website, um, giving you a sense of um, the kinds of resources that are on the website. So you've got tabs along the top and you can like build a funding plan. It's, uh, you click on that and it tells you the kind of beginning, the nuts and bolts of what does it mean to build a funding plan, um, which, is, which is essentially Trying to understand, okay, let's say for instance, I'm in second year of my program. What funding do I have laid out for me over the coming years? What funding am I going to need? And how do I plan to make sure that I'm going to be funded for the remainder of my PhD? Lots of resources like that. Um, and then also on there, there's a link to our blog. Um, and essentially, GradFund is putting out every week uh, blogs. Um, and they just cover like anything and everything you can imagine. Um, we've had it going for years and it's searchable. So it's, it's actually, I would say, one of the most useful resources um, on the web page. You can just search in there, for instance, um, 
budgets. If you want to understand how how do I create a budget, what should I be thinking about when I'm creating a budget program? And there will be posts that we've created over the years, um, multiple posts usually on these things. Uh, so that's really, really useful. Um, and then we're on Twitter and Facebook and all these kinds of things. And that's useful because essentially the way that, uh, oh, and also the newsletter, essentially the ways that Grad Fund is putting out its information. Um, uh, emails will often go to grad directors in the department and then they will usually share them on to the department um, to their students. But uh, we also send out um, kind of notices on the newsletter and on social media. And um, it's a more direct way of finding out, um, for instance, if we have a workshop, somebody from Fulbright is going to give a talk, that, that will be blasted out on social media and so on. So if you want to kind of um, make sure that you um, are getting immediate information about external um, funding, I would sign up for, for some of those things. And then I wanted to go through a kind of overview of applying for funding. So th this image is kind of getting at what I started to talk about before, which is like this integrative approach so that you're not seeing Bradman <coughs> as the only resource for editing and reviewing yeah. your um, applications, but you're seeing that and one kind of piece in this broader picture. Um, this image is also trying to talk about how um, you want to think of uh, applying for external resources as part of all the other steps that you're doing in your graduate program. So um, if I might give a kind of personal example. In my program um, in anthrop cultural anthropology, we do three years of coursework. Um, the fourth year is meant to be field work. Um, theoretically, the fifth year is meant to be write up. I've never heard of anyone in our program who finishes <laughs> in five years. But um, uh, during my first three years of coursework, I personally felt that I wasn't ready to apply for these grants because the commonly in anthropology is often thought of. That your fourth year when you do field work is when you'll be applying for those external funds. So you, you'll have five years of promise funding, um, four or five years, and field work is where you get the um, external uh, awards to fund your research. Uh, so I didn't really get into applying until <coughs> in my third year. Um, and it wasn't really until a little bit later, and then of course when I was working for grad fund, that I realized how helpful it would have been to be thinking about grants in my first and second year. So one example would be, there are a lot of small awards that don't give a lot of money. They might be $500, might be $2,000 or $5,000. They're not going to, for instance, in my research, I needed to go to Australia. I think it costs $1,400, um, let alone living costs, all those kinds of things. Um, so some of these small awards weren't going to pay for um, you know, large field work but having those small awards kind of under your belt, they give you experience about how to apply for external funding, how um, to present your research to an interdisciplinary audience. You usually get some kind of feedback from reviewers that helps you kind of um, move your uh, project along. Uh, then you're also going to you're going to be better set and more competitive for those bigger later grants because they can see that you've already been funded um, and they have, and you have had the experience and the kind of practice to be more competitive after them. So what um, the things that are here in case you can't read, you've got like coursework, publications, teaching if you're um, a TA, a lot of students are TA during your program. Um, a lot of the things that you just have to think about as a graduate student and fellowships and awards are kind of, um, we're suggesting it, are clicking in there. They're just a piece of the puzzle. Um, and you want to think about how each of these can kind of feed off each other. For instance, you might be preparing, how can you kind of align a publication that you might be preparing with a grant application? Um, and this is just plugging some of the, <laughs> what I was mentioning before. 
the reasons why it's really useful to apply for external funding. So learning to communicate your research ideas effectively. Uh, usually what we find when students come with us is that um, PhD students especially have really great interesting projects um, and they're in the process of kind of fleshing out exactly how that project is going to work but um, they haven't had the opportunity to practice communicating that in an accessible way to people who aren't specialists in a kind of efficient accessible way um, and as you go through the PhD and then as you um, finish the PhD, that becomes more and more important, even if you're not going into academia, being able to, um, the kind of the genre of grant writing is so important um, in academic and non-academic settings. Uh, obviously, it brings recognition to your scholarship. It's a really good line in your CV. Um, and the more grants you get, the more competitive you are. <coughs> Onwards. Um, oh, and I, as I mentioned, it's just really important skill. Um, just a little bit on um, lingo, grants versus fellowships. You probably, I, I probably myself have been using um, awards, grants, fellowships. Just to clarify, grants are awards that are um, designed for a specific project that you're doing. So when you apply for a grant, it means you have to apply with a budget. So uh, maybe a well-known example might be, I don't know, um, I, I could see on our database that some students in your department have applied for NSF awards, like the doctoral dissertation research improvement grant. Um, that is an example of a grant because you are telling them, I need you to give me X amount of money in that case, it's usually under $20,000 um, to do these set of things. And in the application, you're including a budget that says exactly how you're going to spend every cent of that money. Versus a fellowship, um, and I did see that students in your department have also applied for the NSF GRF, Graduate Research Fellowship. So those awards are, um, it's a set something, essentially. So usually you know, you might be, might be twenty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars per year, um, and those don't include budgets. You're if you're accepted, um, then you get the set amount of money. Um, and so just thinking about uh, the different kinds of funders out there. So what we've got here is discipline specific, interdisciplinary, specific topic or theme, uh, stage of scholarship, and so on. So I'm um, trying to think for you, there, there are some education specific um, grants and awards out there uh, <laughs> that are just designed specifically for that discipline. More often than not, there are interdisciplinary um, grants. So like the NSF, a lot of NSF awards um, are span a whole, whole um, range of disciplines. Um, and then a lot of them will be um, topical. So looking at um, violence, how to um, stop violence in society, or looking at a particular disease, which is not relevant to you guys, but that's a common um, topic. Uh, and this is some of the things that we would go over in a um, help with a funder meeting. When you're looking, once you think that um, you, know, you might be eligible or competitive for an award, these are the, some of the kinds of things that you want to think about. So eligibility, every grant website is different. And it's very frustrating because you have to kind of, every time you go and look at a new grant, you have to kind of start to understand what how their website is set, is set up. But essentially on every one of these websites, there's going to be a component that lists eligibility. You kind of have to sift through the website to find it. And it's super important because you might be the exact, doing the exact project that this funder is designed to fund, but you're not a US citizen, so you're not going to be able to apply. And you don't want to kind of jump the gun before you check the eligibility. Um, the next most important thing is funder mission and goals. And this is what we focus on a lot in those help with the funder meetings, which is um, often when you see a, a short description of a grant, 
and check the eligibility, you become convinced that um, you know what they're looking for and that your project is a perfect match and you should just present it exactly how you presented it to your committee defending your proposal, you could say. Um, but very often, unless you do a, a more thorough search, you, you don't understand what the funder is really looking for. So they might describe that they're um, looking, um, for instance, there's an award that's designed um, to study violence in society. But until people actually kind of go through that website and understand it better, they don't realize that they're actually only funding quantitative research on, on violence. So we get a lot of students um, in the more kind of social science humanity side who want to apply to that award, but you really need to understand what the funder really wants to fund. Um, and get a sense of the mission, what, why um, a foundation for the government usually provided these funds. What did they want to create? What kinds of scholars did they want to um, help support? Uh, and then this is just a, um, an overview of how, how um, award applications um, function. You know, the big picture. So this is what I was mentioning before, that these are your um, key partnerships. So your faculty being the most important, that's you know, your committee or if you don't have a committee, the um, faculty or, who are working with you, um, they're going to provide the dis discipline specific um, feedback. Then the grant fund is going to help give that kind of outside reader perspective. Um, and then program officers they're the people that I mentioned before. So essentially for every major grant, there's somebody whose job it is to be a point of contact with um, students. And students um, often are really afraid to reach out to, um, to these um, funders, but we're constantly reminding them there are people that are literally paid to, to do that. Um, Obviously, you do need to check the website yourself and do your due diligence. <coughs> but once you've done that, if there are things that you don't understand about awards, program officers are there to answer those kinds of questions. Um, and then we also just recommend other graduate students are a really helpful resource um, for uh, so asking maybe people who had years above you, um, what kind of awards did you apply for, or other students who are doing similar kinds of topics. Really useful resource. Um, and then the application cycle. So another major issue that often comes up in our meetings is that let's say at this time of year, so we're in March, students might contact us and say, I don't have funding for the following year and I'm looking for um, awards or grants that I can get to fund me the following year. Um, and that's because students don't realize that this the cycle for applying for awards, having them reviewed, and then the funds finally become available is a really long, almost a year. So when you're applying, at least for large grants, so basically the bigger the grant, the longer the, um, the, the cycle between application and when funds become available. So fall um, semester is kind of grant season because You'll be applying when, if you're applying for a fellowship or a grant that's going to fund you in that following academic year, the deadlines for those awards are going to be in the fall of that previous year. Does that make sense? So if you, in 2019, most, most grants and fellowships are going to be due in fall 2019 in order to fund the academic year 2020 to 2021. Um, so when students come to us in March 2019, we have to tell them you're not going to be eligible for large grants um, or fellowships to fund this coming academic year. There might be some small um, awards, $500, $2,000. There's not really a nice thing to tell um, abstract graduate students. Um, so that's the kind of timeline um, in order to apply for grants. Um, then we say, um, so Teresa especially has done some analysis of successful grant applications. 
And her analysis shows that students who allow about three to six months to prepare these applications are better set to be competitive. And that, so that's another thing that students might come to us a few weeks before a grant application is due. Um, and they don't realize that this process takes time to get to make a competitive application because it's not just you deciding to sit down and write for like three days straight with no sleep and then um, getting, you know, handing it in. It has to go through um, this kind of cycle of review, which goes back to that key partnerships um, slide before. So <coughs> successful applicants are ones that you know, leave enough time to draft something and put it out into the world. A professor, um, you know, your committee members that can give you feedback, then you go back and redraft it. Then you need to grab time to make it from an outside perspective. And you kind of go around that cycle a number of times, um, and they're the ap applications that uh, tend to be competitive. And um, that just takes time because, you know, you can't expect uh, a professor to re read and respond immediately, and you, um, can't make a meeting with grad fund like the day before. That also takes some time. Um, although that turnaround is, is pretty quick. Um, oh, and then again, just emphasizing the length of time. Even once you find out that you might be um, successful with a grant, those funds might not become available for you know, another few months. So just the, the message is it takes time to start early. Um, and then just giving you a really brief overview of the proposals, what they look like um, uh, in most awards. So essentially, most um, big grants have a research proposal component, which could be anywhere from like two to 10 pages, um, where you outline the research that you're asking for funding. But then they usually include these other things so most of them usually include a personal statement. Um, I, I get this, I'm, I'm not American, so this was very foreign to me, but I get the sense that maybe um, in the US education system, it's a little bit more common. Um, and you want to think about all of these things in your applications as like fitting together like a jigsaw. So um, the research proposal is where you flesh out some components of you know, what your, you know, your scholarly significance of your project. And then the personal statement is often where you're um, showing, for instance, how you've been involved in extracurricular activities that help to flesh out the kind the ways in which you want to um, help you. And the ways in which you want your scholarship to contribute to society, for instance. So again, all these things really depend on the specific grant that you're applying to. Um, which is why we suggest you have the, the meetings with us because we can kind of help you flesh out what each award wants, what they want from each of these components. Um, usually you need letters of recommendation. So that's one, you, one thing you want to think about when you're looking at these awards is um, you know, finding out if you need that and then giving um, professors enough time to do that for you. And then this is just a list of some of the um, most common issues that we find in um, um, applications that we review. So in a positive sense, competitive applications are usually clear and concise. So, and one of the most important things there is no jargon. So uh, probably one of the most common things we're doing when we're reviewing applications is just underlining discipline specific words that um, non-experts aren't going to understand and talking to students about how they can either not use them or just clearly define them um, and uh, another big thing when we say a concretely defined topic with a limited scope um, phd students myself being in this category you know, we want to um, change the world <laughs> with our research. Competitive applications are one that 
have a de clearly defined scope that are not usually trying to convince the reviewers um, about everything that we're doing in our entire PhD over five years, but we're asked, we're um, usually kind of um, presenting a smaller aspect of our research and showing how if they give us the funds, we will successfully do what we set out to do. Because um, uh, Reviewers having a sense that projects are not going to be feasible is a very common reason why people aren't funded. They might be convinced that this is a great project, but unless the applicant can convince them that within the scope of the fellowship or board they're applying for, that they're going to be able to you know, complete what they set out to do, um, they're going to be hesitant about giving the money. Um, and accessible to a broad audience, which um, I've kind of mentioned before, but essentially most award applications are interdisciplinary review boards to, um, or at least they're uh, non-specialists within that discipline we're doing. So you really just have to learn how to communicate your ideas um, to a broad audience. Um, and then this is just what to do now. So um, make an appointment with Grad Fund. Um, and then, you know, think about how GradFund can work, how you can use both the resources of GradFund and um, your faculty um, to help you create competitive applications um, and sign up for our newsletter and social media and so on. And I, um, I just wanted to show you, in case nobody knew, we're just over there. <laughs> So it would, with meetings, you can meet with us in person in the, it's the graduate school building on Bishop, one block up on the corner there. Um, but you can also have online meetings with us. So you can meet with us. Um, I live in New York, so, and I have used GradFund a lot <laughs> in my graduate education, and I, I do a lot of Skype meetings. So then back to their questions. Thank you so much. It's really helpful. Um, before we like set up even our first meeting, does that like should we have materials that we're bringing into that first? Like, or is it just we come in and say like generally what we're doing? Um, so before you have a meeting with us, I, I don't have a slide that shows the um, how you made it make a meeting online. Um, so I should explain that a little bit. Um, you'll go onto the GradFund website, gradfund.rutgers.edu, um, and you'll say that you want to meet with us. It'll then come up with a, a time, a calendar, and you can um, pick who you want to make a meeting with. So there'll be me and other, there's about seven or so of us. And on the website, you can actually go into our, our bios, so you can look you know, what discipline we're in, um, uh, and so we've got people in English, um, I'm in anthrop cultural anthropology, we've got evolutionary anthropology, sociology, um, I'm forgetting people. Um, anyway, we've got a range of disciplines. Um, and then you can click, when we have availabilities, you can click in there to make a meeting with us. Then what happens is you'll get an automatic email. We'll say you've created your meeting successfully, it tells you that you then need to submit meet uh, materials two days by 9 a.m. two days before. The, so you know how we have the three different kinds of meetings, the what can I apply for, the help with the funder, and then the application review. Those first two, all you have to submit is a CV. Um, and it doesn't need to be the flashiest CV. It's just that helps us because often um, when students make a meeting, they will say, oh, I'm interested in this funder. But the CV is the kind of simplest way of getting a handle on what this person's background is and maybe like what their research is. Um, but the more information you can give us, the better. So when you go in to make that meeting, actually when you set up with us, you set up a profile. So you can include things like research keywords and all those kinds of things. The more info you give us, the better like targeted we can be with finding awards and so on. So 
my long answer to your question was yes. When you make a meeting with us, you do have to submit something. But the two kind of earlier appointments, it's just a CV. It's only when you're having a, a SA review meeting that you do need to submit your materials. To the SA. Um, one point for those of you in the room, I'm not sure who's on, but if you're funded by the GSE, one way or the other, you know, some of these larger grants don't cover health or tuition, they may just be a stipend. You should not not do that because of this, all right? We will make up that, we want to encourage you to go for those funds, and we will make sure that you are kept whole on these things. So don't say, oh, well, they're not going to give me everything I'm getting right now, so I shouldn't go for it. That should never be a reason not to go for it, okay? Yeah, this, some of these kind of things happen in programs where students think, oh, it's not worth my time to apply for these awards because something like that, or they're worried that the, yeah, for the number of reasons they're worried it's not worth their time. And it's usually only later in your program that you realize it really is worth your time. It, it, yeah, it's really nice to be able to get an external thing to put it on your Vita. For all the reasons Don said, to go through the exercise of learning how to present yourself in that sort of way, you know, for it. So, um, if you see those opportunities, you should go for it. If you have any questions, you know, have these talk to these guys, but in terms of funding and things like that and what the implications are, you should talk to them. Okay. I know that's not what Brisbane does, but you if you know about it, could you tell us more about the school graded study award? Um, yeah, in like a broad picture. Uh, so essentially the awards, so there's a pre I'm forgetting what it's called, but it's like a pre-dissertation award. A lot of these were actually just due um, a few weeks ago. Pre-dissertation award is a small kind of seed funding, it's about up to $2,000 I think, and that's meant to give you um, uh, funding to do kind of like pre-field work research if you need to go somewhere, if you need lab equipment or whatever it is. Um, for early graduate students, so often students in their first, second, third year might be applying for those things. Um, and then there is there's conference travel funding. Um, some of these are also kind of like program by program. Um, some of these awards come through a particular department. Uh, then there's the Verdier um, Fellowship, which is a fellowship to fund your final year of dissertation write-up. Um, then there are also honor awards. So um, often kind of later on in your program, um, honor awards to um, very competitive um, graduate studies awards for really successful graduate students. Um, am I forgetting other things? You can, um, these are all on the graduate school websites. Um, and so that's, even though we can't help with those applications, uh, we, we recommend that when you're doing that kind of build a funding plan, you're thinking about all of them together. So, you know, you're looking at, okay, I can only apply for the pre-dissertation award probably in my, let's say, first, second or third year. Okay. So I'm going to apply you know, in X year for that. How does that affect the external awards that I might be applying for? And in all of that, when you're doing this big scale thinking, you want to assume that you're not going to be successful <laughs> because um, uh, often when you start out, you know, your first award, maybe it's not successful and you don't want to kind of peg everything um, on you know, getting X award in the following year. So that funding plan allows you to kind of have backups. And if you're going to put in a um, proposal, if you can get it to other faculty or even me in advance, we can give you some feedback there too. Um, and ultimately, for some of these things, if we have multiple awards, they'll ask us to rank those things, but we'll still provide you guidance, you know, say, but you got to do it in advance, right? If you do it two days before it's due. Trying to figure that out. 
Yeah, so those School of Graduate Studies awards, they're often have ranks, rankings within the department. <coughs> but the external awards um, are not ranked by your, your department isn't going to be influencing those. Yeah. Um, those SGS managed awards, they do have a component where you're kind of, usually where you have some open process to the university. But again, that's not your department. So for these external awards, don't fear about reaching out to your department. They're meant to help you, you know, give you feedback for these applications. The SGS and managed awards are, yeah, they're managed by um, within Rutgers. I have another question. Yeah. I remember last year we just this was something about this summer program. Summer mentoring. Yeah. Program. About it, or and if it's if it's happened, it can happen every year. So it usually happens every year, um, and that was what I was um, mentioning earlier. So usually you would apply around this time of the year, um, and then if you're accepted into the program through the summer, there are multiple meetings. It's not running this year, but usually um, you will have. I think it's about kind of like four or so. Um, workshops where you'll come in here with other people that are in the mentoring program and you workshop together about how to research your funders and prepare your applications and so on. Then you also have one-on-one -on -one meetings with grad fund staff um, and the, the idea is you're using this, you're having a kind of network of support to help you prepare for grants in the fall, um, that big kind of season of grants. Um, but this year we're not able to run it. Next year, I assume that it would be. It, it has run every year, usually, so it should be running the following year. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope you guys will think about uh, pursuing this, and and really remember Don's expectation. You know, you can just start with some small ones. Just get a taste of doing this before you go for big ones. So even. Even if you're on grants where you can, they have, you know, you can get support, even if you can get two grants on your own name to do that, it's a good thing to do. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.